Well, how you doing, uh, Life Point? Uh, glad you guys are doing pretty good this morning. Uh, know that we're praying for you all, uh, your family, you as well, uh, friends, co-workers. We know COVID is still uh, going round and round and affecting a lot of us, or loved ones, or what have you. But know this, God is still good, and God is still in control. Uh, even with uh, uh, political things that's going on, even with some of the division that the country is experiencing right now, God is still in control. And so I just want you to know that before we begin here uh, in the passage of Acts 25 here. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace, your love, Lord. Thank you for allowing me to love you, Lord, more today than I did yesterday. Because your love just keeps going and growing. From what you do, Lord, from who you are, and Lord, what you will do here in the future. Uh, thank you for blessing Life Point. Thank you for blessing the families of Life Point, Lord. Our, uh, even our family, our friends, our neighbors. Um, many of the things that we're experiencing right now, Father, we can't thank you enough. And so, Lord, um, let us be rest assured in you. Let us be comforted in you. Through your word, Lord knowing that you are true. You will see us through, Father. And so, Father, I just pray that you would challenge us today, even, Lord, throughout this week, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, Father. Your word is true. We can't thank you enough, Lord. So, Father, I just ask that you speak through, through me, for me, and be with me, Lord. Because your word, your love letter, is gloriously simple and simply glorious, Lord. In order that we may tell others about your son, Jesus, that they also could be saved. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Purpose. We heard of the word purpose. How many of you know that you have a purpose? You know, the reason I ask because some people say that they have purpose. They have a purpose. And some say, eh, well, I don't that I don't know what that purpose is. Check it out. Remember that uh, drill sergeant in the movie Forrest Gump? One of my top ten uh, favorite movies there. When uh, Gump was in boot camp. And he ran up to Forrest and he asked him, Gump! What's your sole purpose in this army? Remember what Gump said? To do whatever you tell me, Drill Sergeant. <laughs> and, he, and the Drill Sergeant told him, he said, um, you must be a genius, Gump. And I'm saying it without the explicit, all right, the, 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 the curse words, all right. He said, Gump, you must be a genius. That's the most outstanding answer I've ever heard. You must have an IQ of 160. You are gifted, Private Gump. You ever heard it saying, who you are, it's not for you to decide, but for you to discover. You ever heard that? Who you are is not for you to decide, but for you to discover. And on life point, just like Gump, just like Forrest Gump the movie, as simple as he was, he discovered a lot. Of what his sole purpose was, to tell you the truth. 
even some of the, uh, the mishaps, the bad things that he went through. You remember, uh, without a father, uh, he had a low IQ, uh, crooked back, his legs were messed up, he was always picked on. But through that, he was a football champion in Alabama. He went to the Army and got a Medal of Honor while he was in Vietnam. Remember, he also became the ping pong champ while he was in the military. Go figure, right? And also when he got out, he became the CEO, the founder of Bubba Gump Shrimp. Incredible. And last but not least, to top it off, he married his childhood sweetheart, Jenna. <laughs> he married her. Now, of course, uh, that was a movie, okay, the, the Gump character. Uh, he spoke of God often. Him and his uh, mother, who uh, Sally, played, Sally Fields played his mother. But our purpose in life of who we are is check it out to glorify God. It's to glorify God. That's our sole purpose in life. Remember what I said, who you are, it's not for you to decide, but for you to discover. In other words, God created me. He created you. Now what are you going to do with what you have? No matter your background, okay, no matter if you're rich, you, you are poor, no matter if you're disabled, you have a certain disability, no matter your IQ being low or what have you, what are you going to do with what you got? Is what God is saying. How are you going to glorify me? John MacArthur said it this way God's intention in the creation of man was that man should glorify God, enjoy God's fellowship, live his life in the will of God, and by this, accomplish. God's purpose for man in the world. We were created, life born to reign, to rule, and to have dominion. But that was lost, if you remember from Adam and Eve. Uh, think of Isaiah 43, verse 7, where God told Isaiah, listen, everyone who bears my name and is created for my glory, I have formed them, says the Lord. Indeed, I have made them. I think of Colossians 1.16. For everything was created by him, speaking of Jesus, in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Think of that. That's why we are to glorify God. You may be thinking, why should we glorify him? Why? why? Well, because of what he's done for you and me. Think about it. God loved us so much. God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. To die for our sins. I know we say that all the time, but it's not a cliche. Think about that. He paid a debt that he did not owe so that we who owed that debt could be saved. We can pay it. We can pay it. Now, God will use those experiences that we've been through, our, our backgrounds and all that, as different highway systems, if you will that lead to the ultimate and main reason that he has called us to glorify him. After all, think of Romans 8.28, how God uses so many things, of how God uses the broken, of how God uses the disqualified. You still have a purpose to glorify him. Romans 8.28, you know the passage. We know that God causes all things 
not some things, but all things to work together for the good to those who love him, those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. To his purpose. Think of the Apostle Paul. How God used him. How God used his background. His past experience. His pedigree, if you will. I mean, Paul thought that it was his purpose to glorify God by going against the Christian. This new way, this new sect, if you will, and Jesus being they, their leader. He thought it was his mission to go against them. He thought that was what God wanted him to do. Remember, before Paul was a Pharisee, he said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Learned under the feet of Gamaliel. And we went against the church. Remember that? He went against Jesus. And he also stood by the murder, uh, the, the, those who murdered at Stone Stephen. Remember that? He held, Apostle Paul, he held the clothes of all those. Paul, hold this, hold this garment for me right quick. We're getting ready to stone this guy. He's speaking of Jesus. But after Jesus got a hold of Paul, <laughs> and after his eyes were, and heart was open, guess what? Paul went full throttle. He went all out. And matter of fact, the Bible says immediately when Paul was saved, he went out preaching. He went out preaching the good news. Of Jesus Christ. Uh, during that time, uh, Paul went on three different missionary journeys. He was faced with beatings uh, at least five different times. And the Romans also wanted to get a hold of him. Also, remember a couple of chapters back in Acts, until they found out he was a Roman citizen. Paul was also left for dead. On top of that, he was in prison. But Paul didn't complain. He went through it all. And after facing conflict after conflict, after 20 years or so, of witnessing to others about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and also raising up many churches in Asia Minor, and also some in Europe, here he is in Acts 25 being questioned, uh, being falsely accused with lie after lie after lie from the Jewish leadership and also from the Roman government. More in particular, Felix. Why? Why Paul went through all this here? Why go through it all, Paul? Paul would tell you if he was here today, all for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul knew what his purpose was. He knew what his purpose was. He knew what his calling was. And may that be for me and you, Flight Point. And so what I wanted to title this, I titled it called, uh, Called for God's Purpose. Called for God's Purpose. And being called for God's purpose, number one, is when you know that you're called for God's purposes, know that God is always working behind the scenes. No matter what's going on, God is still working behind the scenes. Uh, join me right here in Acts 25. Verses 1 through 6. And it reads, Three days after Festus arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Now remember, Festus, uh, he was, Festus, he's the new governor. 
and he's replaced Governor Felix, okay, in Judea. And so this guy Festus, this new governor coming in, uh, he was known to be more fair, okay, and more reasonable than the other guy, Felix. And see, the new governor isn't as knowledgeable. He wasn't as knowledgeable about the Jewish religion as Felix was. Because remember, Felix, he was married to a Jewish wife. He had a Jewish wife. But the thing is, in an attempt to repair Rome's relationship with the Jews, Festus, this new governor, he still wanted to understand why the Jews were trying to kill Paul. Okay? And in verse 2, the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews presented their case against Paul to Festus, and they appealed. Verse 3, asking for a favor against Paul that Festus would summon him to Jerusalem. Because you remember last chapter, they wanted to ambush and kill Paul. Okay? But they also wanted to do it here in Acts 25 with the new governor coming out. And so it said, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, good. That murdering maniac, Felix, is gone. And so the Jewish people are now thinking, so we can probably get somewhere with this new governor, Festus. He'll probably be more lenient when we can kill him, kill Paul. They were, in fact, preparing an ambush along the road for Paul. And you think about that, really? Here we go again. Here we go again. The last time it was about 40 men who were going to uh, ambush and kill Paul. As a matter of fact, they were not going to eat or drink anything until they had an opportunity to do it. In verse 4, Fest, Festus, however, he answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea. And that he himself was about to go there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those of you who have authority, listen, go down with me and accuse him. If he has done, done anything wrong. In verse six, when he had spent not more than eight, ten days among them, he went down to Caesarea. The next day, seated at the tribunal, he commanded Paul to be brought in. Wow, talk about political power. Just to get what you want at that. Remember this right here at Life Point. God always has the last word. God always, he will always have the last say so. No matter who's in office, okay? No matter who was the old governor. No matter who's the new governor coming in, no matter who the, uh, uh, the Jewish authorities is, between uh, the, the Pharisees and said, uh, the uh, said Sadducees, the Sanhedrin total, doesn't matter. God always has a ram in the bush. I want you to see that and know that. He will always have that, again, if you were playing poker, I never have, but you know, I think the royal flush is the top dog. Think of God having that top dog card, that royal flush, that will trump anything else. The enemy's card. Regarding his people. That's what God would do. That's what he would do. And then number two, when you're called for God's purpose, know that God is steady moving us toward the goal. Actually toward the goal line. That's what he was doing with Paul. Each time all the way through from uh, in the book of Acts, that that's what we see. Paul or Peter, God is steady moving them towards the goal line for God's glory. Toward the goal line. Now, I think of football, you know, even when you don't see or feel like God is not doing nothing. Remember, let me go back to your purpose. Remember your purpose. Remember your calling. 
You know, the enemy's defense may seem impregnable, right? Like you can't get through. Airtight. Like my Titans, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, two Sundays, they, they lost, okay? But that defense that they were playing against, the team they was playing against, was, was they had a good defense. And they stopped my running back, uh, Henry. You know, they, they, they stopped him more than a couple of times. And he couldn't get a score. But, you know, Titans, they'll be back next year. Super Bowl bound. All right? And so a lot of times we may be thinking like, Paul, you know, Lord, where are you? You see how they lie, lying about me, Lord? Lord, actually, you got the wrong person that came into office. You got the wrong person in charge now. This, this person may be getting ready to take away our religious freedom, religious liberty. God, what's going on? But just like Apostle Paul, we ought to know also that God's got us. He, he's just, God is just moving us inch by inch down the field to the goal, across that goal line. And, and check this out. And God will use people that are against him. He will use other nations that are against him, against his kingdom, and against his people. He'll allow that. You got to remember this. God sets up kings, governors or whoever. And he also brings them down. He also brings them down. Look at verse seven. When he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, speaking of Paul, and brought many serious accusations and charges that were not they were not able to even prove it. Verse 8, then Paul made his defense. And Paul has been making his defense at least out of the six times, four times right now. And Paul made his defense. He says, neither against the Jewish law, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I sinned in any way. They know Paul, the apostle Paul did not, uh, he did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong other than Convicting their hearts of what they already know is true. Remember what Felix said last chapter? When Paul was given the gospel, Felix told Paul, hey, hey, come back later, man. Come back later. That's because Felix was being convicted. He knew what was true. But yet he left Paul in prison for another two years. Let him, and you know, had him in custody at least for another two years, not in prison. And then in verse 9, but Festus, this new governor, he wanting to do a Jews a favor, <laughs> just like the old one, Felix, replied to Paul, hey Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and be tried before me on these charges? Are you, Paul? Paul replied, verse 10, I'm standing at, this, at Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have no, done no wrong to the Jews, as even you yourself know very well. Remember in, in John 18, the Gospel of John, when they, uh, they had already captured Jesus, uh, had arrested him, and uh, they're questioning him, the high priest and all. And so Jesus told this to him. He said, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews gathered. I haven't spoken anything in secret. Verse 21, why do you question me, Jesus said. Question those who heard what I told them. Look, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officials standing by Jesus, guess what? He slapped Jesus. The Bible says he slapped him. And he said, is this the way you talk or answer the high priest? Jesus said, I mean, can you imagine right quick? You know, 
uh, slapping Jesus, you know what I'm saying? I, I know they did worse, you know, as far as uh, on, being on the cross, but wow, the audacity. Jesus said this here, he said, if I have spoken wrongly, give evidence about the wrong. But if I rightly, why did you hit me, man? Why did you hit me? Listen, Satan couldn't stop Jesus from going to the cross. And they can't even stop Paul from going to Rome. Remember, he's heading toward the goal, the goal line. Listen, if Paul, if they had a chance to stop Paul, if he didn't go to Rome, we wouldn't have the prison epistles. All the epistles that Paul, the apostle, had wrote while he was in prison. You know, the, the, the epistles, the, books of, the book of uh, Ephesians. The book of uh, the Philippians, the book of Colossians, and also the book of Philemon. We wouldn't have those four. And then verse 11 here, back in Acts 25, if then I did anything wrong, Paul says, and I'm deserving of death. Listen, I'm not trying to escape death, he says, but if there is nothing to what these men accuse me of, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. And Paul could say that, remember? Why? Because he was, a, he, is, he was a Roman citizen. He didn't buy his citizenship like a lot of the guys, you know. If you bought it, you could lose it. Paul, uh, he was born and raised, okay, as a Roman citizen. Paul would be like, check my paperwork if you want to really go and see from my family. Go and check. I appeal to Caesar. In verse 12, then after Festus conferred with his council, he replied, you have appealed to Caesar? Man, to Caesar you will go. You know, remember what Jesus told the disciples in Luke about acknowledging him before others? When you get in a certain position, that you have to acknowledge Christ before men, and in this case, to high up officials, political fig figures, if you will. Jesus said this here, whenever they bring you before synagogues and rulers and authorities, don't worry about what you should defend yourselves or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that very hour what you must say. Again, God's got you like he has Paul. You, just like Paul, speaking of us, stand in God's truth. Stand and acknowledge Christ in God's truth. So when you're operating in God's purpose for you, remember God is working behind the scenes, even when you don't think so. Remember God is steady moving you towards the goal line when they try and stop you. And also, number three, uh, last point, number three, God will give you the opportunity to make him known that even human kings will want to hear you about Jesus, about King Jesus. The question is, when they hear about him, what will they do with him? What would they do? Verse 13, several days later, King Agrippa, this guy, King Agrippa, he comes on the scene. And he comes with Bernice. Okay, King Agrippa and Bernice. Well, these two are brothers and sisters. Okay, uh, Bernice uh, was, was married to uh, the Harris, one of the Harris before. And she ends up leaving him to get back with King Agrippa, this particular King Agrippa, the last King Agrippa uh, of the Herods. He is the last of the Herod dynasty, okay? Oh, brothers and sisters. And there was a lot of talk about them too, incestual relationships. And so they arrived in Caesarea 
and paid a courtesy visit, just a quick visit, on Festus. Festus, the new governor. And verse 14, since they were staying there for a few days, uh, Festus presented Paul's case to the king. Of course he would, you know, saying there's a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. Verse 15, when I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews, they presented their case and asked that he be condemned. Verse 16, I answered them that it is not the Roman custom, guys, to give someone up before the accused faces the accusers and has an opportunity to for defense against the charges. Uh, so when they had assembled here, I didn't delay. The next day I took my seat at the tribunal and ordered the man be brought in, speaking to Paul, to be brought in. And, and remember, this is a formal courtroom proceeding, if you will. It's very formal, just like we see in our world today. In verse 18, the accuser stood up, but they brought no charge against him of the evils that I was expecting, Agrippa. Okay, uh, verse 19, instead they had some disagreements with him about uh, their own religion and about uh, a certain Jesus, okay, a dead man that Paul had claimed to be alive. Life point, he is alive. <laughs> and Paul wasn't lying about that. And in verse 20, since I was at loss in a dispute over such things, I asked him if he would go to Jerusalem. I asked Paul, hey, would you go to Jerusalem then and be tried there regarding these matters, Paul? Verse 21, but when Paul appealed to Caesar to be held for trial by the emperor, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I could send him to Caesar. That's the deal, uh, uh, King Agrippa. You know, I know you're not a, a Roman. You're not a Roman citizen, Agrippa. Uh, you're not even Jewish. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, you ain't even ruling within Judea. But since the emperor is let allowing you and your uh, guys that you've been the last of the Herods, you know, to uh, be somewhat in charge of certain spots within the Jerusalem community, I'm coming to you. What else can I do? Because I don't want to go before the emperor, Caesar, which is in this case, Nero. This dude was crazy. I don't want to go before him and have no facts of Paul, the accuser, of who they're accusing, you know, to go before Caesar, I, I just can't see it. I have no case. Because, you know, back then, the emperor, Rome looked at the emperor like the deity, like a god. That's how they looked at the emperors, the Caesars, Caesars, if you will. And in verse 22, Agrippa said to Festus, okay, I want to hear the man myself. Festus said, King, you will hear him. Tomorrow you will hear him. And that's where either uh, Pastor Glenn or Kevin will pick up that one next week. But you see the drama unfolding, though. I mean, Paul was going to battle, guys. And he was in battle for Jesus where he was not about to give up. He was not about to let up, put up, shut up, or fold up in front of these high officials. It don't matter. Now, that doesn't mean we should be belligerent, nothing like that, because Paul was not. Or disrespectful toward them. As a matter of fact, Paul honored the office of these officials. As we are told to do so, also, you know, also as Christians, as children of God, whose ever 
over us in charge that whoever that we have voted for or whoever you didn't vote for. We still pay them honor for the office. That they're holding. Again, even if they're ungodly. Even if they're a hypocrite. Even if they're hateful of me. I mean, think of Daniel. When he was there, when, when they, the, the nation of Israel had gotten captured, okay, and sent off to another nation, Babylon, with the rule dictator, with the uh, powerful ruler who was wicked, unjust. And yet Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't put up a fuss. They didn't say, no, we're not going to serve you. No, they, they still honored him. Now think of Jesus. At a time when he came on the scene, um, Agrippa, uh, this, uh, this King Agrippa right now that I'm talking about, his grandfather, he was on the scene when Jesus was born. And remember, he killed all the male children, male babies, two years old and younger. Killing two-year-old male babies. And even if it was Jesus, even if it was Jesus saying, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Okay? He still paid his taxes. No, honor those who are over us in the government. And see, Paul knew what his calling and his purpose was. He knew what his purpose was. He knew what his calling was. Paul wasn't worried about it. He knew that God would see him through. He knew that God would get him over or toward that finish line. Rome being that finish line. And that's where he was headed. And his book title called for a purpose. Tony Evans talks about our calling, our purpose. And us being like a good tasty pizza. All right. He said this here, preparing for your calling. It's like going to a fine pizzeria. And me and Teresa have been to some good pizzerias, I'm telling you. From Rome, all over Italy, we eat some good pizza. Okay, and he says, where skilled chefs start with a ball of dough. They roll that dough, they press it, they mash it, then they start pounding on it. And after banging it around for a while, they start throwing it up in the air, you know, twirling it. I can see on the TV just this guy's twirling that pizza. That dough goes through a whole lot so that you and I can have the pleasure of eating it. But when you go to a pizzeria, uh, you don't ask for dough. No, you don't ask for no dough. Hey, can I have some dough? No. You want the good stuff, right? You want the sauce. You want the cheese and maybe some meat, veggies for toppings, right? Everyone wants the good stuff. But you can't get the good stuff until the dough has been prepared. In the same way, we have to be prepared for our calling. Sometimes our preparation starts with some pressing. Uh, sometimes it starts with some mashing. Sometimes we feel tossed around or banged up for a while. Uh, but this is only in preparation for the good stuff. Throughout life's bumps and bruises, God is preparing us me and you, for the perfect destiny that he has created you to live out, us to live out. Yet your responses to those bumps and bruises may determine how quickly you reach your destiny. It's easy to, you know what I'm saying, throw in the towel and walk away when life's challenges seem pointless or it's too painful. But if you keep your eyes focused on God's purposes for you, not your pain, not your pain, God will use your trials for your good and his glory. 
He works all things together for good when you love him and live according to your calling. No pain or experience is wasted. God doesn't waste nothing, not a minute, whatever you've been through. Whatever we're facing in life. Who's ever in charge of the, the nation? Whatever your disability may be. Think of Forrest Gump. To do whatever you tell me, Drill Sergeant, that's what it's about. Rest, recognizing who you are. Recognizing who you will become. No pain is experienced wasted or experience is wasted when you're a child of the king. God will use the good and the bad. Keep your eyes focused on the destination. The end result. You will find and you will find the strength for the journey that takes you there. You have a glorious destiny to discover and live out. Man, I'm telling you, that is powerful. Man, I'm telling you what all Paul the Apostle was going through right now. We just uh, at Acts 25. Wait till one of the pastors go next week. You see how it really unfolds like, oh my goodness, you know what I'm saying? And yet Paul keeps moving forward. Remember now, we wouldn't have those four epistles, those prison epistles. Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philemon, and, and uh, uh, can't think of the other one. But we wouldn't have those four. We wouldn't. While Paul was in prison, it's because he knew his, what his purpose was. Beyond the pain that he was experiencing, he was setting his eyes forward and ahead on Christ Jesus. Keep going, Paul. Keep going across that finish line, that goal line. Rome. It's no matter what others may say about us, about you and I. And whatever persecutions uh, may come your way, or that you've gone through, you just remember that you were called for his purposes. To keep your eyes on him through the process. Through that process. Watch what God would do. It's just like he did through Paul. And there was some tough times. He could do through us. During these tough times. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you for your word, Lord. Lord, we need you each and every single day. The things that we're going through. The things that we're struggling with. Days, months, weeks look uh, bleak. We feel like we can't go on, Lord. It just feels like What's the use, Lord? And there's so much accusations against you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that we could look back in your word and we could see those you use for our good today. For us to keep going. Thank you for allowing us to see our purpose, Lord. No matter the things that we've incurred or went through. I'm thankful, Lord, that you're using them. And pressing us on forward. We thank you, Lord. And we can't thank you enough. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.